I'd like to welcome you to uh, the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Science 2017 Homecoming and Reunion Celebration. My, time flies. Well, um, just last year we were celebrating 100 years. And we're here today to continue the legacy of the school and continue your relationship with the school. Our first event is the Grace Longwell Coyle Lecture in Group Work, The Foundation of Social Change. Grace Coyle made a profound impact on group work, on the study of group work and its practice. Her books and classroom presentations were landmark additions to the field of group work education, contributing to the critical analysis of group leadership, group behavior, and professional education of social workers. Dr. Coyle earned her master's in economics and PhD in sociology from Columbia University. In addition, she was awarded a certificate from the New York School of Social Work. She worked in settlement houses for several years, but it was her work in the YWCA that provided her with a platform for her exploration of group work. Then in 1934, she joined the faculty of what was then called the School of Applied Social Sciences at Western Reserve University, where she developed the first group, first course on group work. Dr. Elizabeth M. Tracy currently holds the Grace Longwell Coyle professorship in her name. Anna Fritz, an alumni of 1957 and a faculty member of the school beginning in 1971, established the Grace Quayle Lectureship due to Grace's profound impact on group work study and practice. Anna herself taught small group work theory and was well loved by her, her students. And with her husband, students and faculty established the Anna Fritz Scholarship. With us today is the recipient of the Anna Fritz Scholarship, Lauren Roberts. Lauren, would you please stand? And we look forward to hearing more about your experience in group work during the discussion, Lauren. Group work has long been a very a vibrant part of the school and part of social work, um, very vibrant. And we're looking forward um, to this morning's discussion to connect the dots to the use of group work today in various settings and to advance its agenda and social action. I'm Sharon Milligan. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the school. And I look forward to having a very full reunion experience with you uh, this weekend. Now I'd like to introduce David Crampton, Associate Professor of Social Work at the Mandel School. And he will share a few reflections on Anna Fritz, but also he'll introduce our presenter, Ms. Ms. Uh, Brodkins. Thank you. Good morning. It's customary in these situations to say it's, I'm really pleased to be here, but in this case, it's really true. Um, so I came to the school in 2002. Uh, my research is on family meetings that we have when we're considering placing a child in foster care. And so Anna Fritz heard that I had some background in group, and then I was on her radar. And I think if I went in my email and searched Anna Fritz, I'd probably find, I don't know, dozens of messages because she was a, well, as you heard, she was a group worker, and she was very concerned that the school would lose this tradition that's so important to our history. And so she helped endow this uh, lectureship, and I feel a certain obligation to making sure that we honor her and group work and Grace Coyle through this lectureship. So then about a year ago, we had the um, Alumni Distinguished uh, Awards, 
and we got word that Margaret Brodkin was getting one of these awards, and she was coming to Cleveland. <laughs> and we on the faculty were so excited because we used a textbook in our community practice class uh, that she wrote a chapter in, which we assigned to the students. So they're like, this is the Margaret Broke, and she's going to be in Cleveland. <laughs> and so we were so excited. So we were emailing her and saying, we're so excited that you're coming, and we use your chapter in our class, and this is going to be great. And she emailed back, she said, I'm excited to come back. And somewhere in her email, she said, I consider myself a group worker. And so I was like, ding. I was like, wow. A famous SAS graduate who's a self-identified group worker, I'm going to file that away because I feel personally responsible for making sure that we have good Grace Coyle speakers. So then I thought, well, that should be great. And of course, the more I read about it, the more I was like, well, this is going to be awesome because she does the kind of work that our students want to do. And she says she's a group worker. So she's going to be able to give a great Grace Coyle lecture. So I really am very happy to be here. I'm so grateful to Margaret for agreeing to come. And when she agreed to do it, she got a little nervous because I've been out of school for a while. And <laughs> just, just talk about your practice experience. I'm sure it'll be fine. So, uh, I need to do a little research. You don't need to do a little research. But of course she did. So she went to the Berkeley School of Social Work Library, where I guess she's a field instructor. She said, I have to do this Grace Coyle lecture. Help me learn about Grace Coyle. And again, she wasn't really was not expected to do that. But I'm so glad that she did because, because you know, librarians, they said, well, what do you want to, you know, so they found Grace Coyle's lecture from 1935 on social work and social change that she gave to a social welfare conference in Montreal in 1935. And it's like dead on what Margaret wanted to talk about, and it's Grace Coyle. So she reads this you know, talk, and, and I have to say to my colleagues, I was interested to see, so Grace Coyle gave this lecture in 1935, and at the top it says, Grace Coyle, Associate Professor of Group Work. And I just think that's interesting, you know. So I'm, I'm an associate professor of social work. I don't know how we make those. So at one point, you could be on the faculty as a group social. So that's what she was, of course. Um, so she gave this fabulous uh, talk about how group work can be used for social change. And Margaret read this, and of course, it resonated with her. Which I said, you don't need to read about Grace Coyle because she's, she's in your genes, OK? She's, she trained the people that trained you at SAS. You're going to know all that. You know this stuff. You use it every day. It's really not necessary to do a lot of research. But I'm, I'm grateful that she did because, of course, the whole reason Anna endowed this scholarship was she wanted us to make sure we read about Grace Coyle and didn't just sort of say, oh, Grace Coyle, she was great, actually knew what she, what she talked about. And so Margaret now has done that. Um, I think I can say probably didn't know a lot about Grace Coyle before we asked her to do this. But now she does. And that's, so I'm just, I don't know, somewhere Anna Fritz is smiling down. And that makes me happy. Because those of you who were on the faculty when she was, she was, she was on us all the time. Where is the group work in the curriculum? And we'd say, it's in there. Don't worry. We don't have a group work concentration anymore, but students will get that content. And so then today, I wanted um, some of my faculty colleagues who teach some of those classes to be on a panel. So I've asked Mark Chupp, who's the chair of our community practice concentration. <laughs> and he designed a, a macro skills class, which every MSAS student is required to take which teaches them about task groups, which is one of the key domains of group work. And he also teaches students who want to do macro community change. And I know he teaches them small groups. It's the Mark Chup version, so it's you know talking sticks and stuff like that. But it's, it's still, it's getting people in small groups to talk about what their issues are and then mobilize change. So we do, t and then, we do have one social work with groups class taught by Nancy Wadsworth, so I asked her to be here today. Um, and, and right now, we're advising our students as they're coming in and telling them what classes to take. 
And so I advise children, youth, and family students. So when I sit with my advisees, I always say, now, where are you in field and are you doing groups? And of course, often they say, oh, oh of course I'm doing groups. And then I say, well, you might want, because we have to advise them on what electives to take. So I say, well, you might want to take the social work with groups class. So I asked Nancy to come today and tell you a little bit about what she teaches in that class. Because if Anna was here, I'd want to be able to assure her, we remember Grace Coyle, we still read her stuff, and we still teach task groups, treatment groups, and even using groups for social change. We still teach that stuff. Um, not just because Grace Coyle was really cool, but because that stuff is actually pretty effective. And so when I tell my students to take Nancy's class, I say, you should take this class because groups are a great way to engage kids. And if you're working in a school setting, it's just a great way to address behavioral issues or whatever it is. Um, so I, I feel good that we are still doing this stuff. And I don't want to go into a lot about Grace Coyle, but um, I grew up in Williamstown, Massachusetts, which is a small college town in Massachusetts where Williams College is, a very wealthy school, I'll say. Next door is North Adams, Massachusetts, which is an um, old mill town that's really fallen on hard times. Grace Coyle grew up in North Adams, went to Drury High School. I mean, it's, just, it's like so weird, like right there. And my mother was an Episcopal priest as I was growing up in Western Mass, and Grace Coyle's father was a congregational minister in North Adams, and my dad still volunteers at the food pantry next to the Congress. I mean, it just, you know, I just feel a certain kinship with Grace Coyle, which, which I never would even known about if it were not for Anna Fritz. So I'm, I'm grateful to, so I'm making some jokes about Anna Press, but I'm grateful that she pushed us down this way because I think our students do need to know this content. So Anna Fritz grew up in Massachusetts. As a girl, she read, it's funny on that uh, thing when you walk in, it says Grace Coyle is as imminent as Jane Addams. Well, they were not exactly the same time. In fact, both Margaret and Grace Coyle, as young girls, read Jane Addams and were inspired by her book to go into social work. So it's not like they were contempt, but, but of course that's, that's the legacy, right? So we, you know, we read about Jane Addams, we read about Grace Coyle, and we say they were all so great, but do we remember the practices that they used? Um, so when I was talking to Margaret about this lectureship, she was like, don't you still have settlement houses in Cleveland? I mean, what happened to all that stuff? Well, we do, but they're, um, they're having trouble with their funding, and I think some of them don't necessarily know this history. So Nancy and I have cooked up a plan to take the information from today and offer it to the settlement house workers and say, look, this is what you guys used to do. You should still do it. I'm not saying they don't do it. Sometimes they, they fall into it. I work with a bunch of them who recently offered a parenting class and they kind of almost stumbled into the idea of after we do the class, let's put the family members together and have them talk to each other. It wasn't an organized group, but it was the same idea. Get these families who are struggling with their involvement with the public child welfare system, seated around a table together with a meal, and mutual aid will happen. It's, it's really cool stuff. It's, it's very powerful, and we need to keep using these sort of things. Um, or another one of my former students uh, works at Providence House, which is a crisis nursery on the west side of Cleveland, if you know it, when it was founded, it was to save the babies from these drug addicted mothers. And so there's a lot of emphasis on saving the babies. And then finally they realized, well, we're going to give the babies back to the mothers, so maybe we should do some work with the mothers. So now they, they do work with the mothers, and when they sort of accidentally fell into this too, where they were teaching the mothers about parenting and kind of put them in a group. And the mothers really bonded with each other because they're having this common experience of trying to raise children in poverty. And they, oh, I'm getting the, I, sorry. Um, 
and the mothers really support each other and they got fired up and they said we need to tell our story and the next time I went to the Providence House fundraiser it wasn't just cute pictures of the babies you're saving they actually had the mothers get up on stage and talk about their experience and it was just it was you know that's like powerful stuff so putting them in small groups inspired them to tell their story so that people would understand Here's why somebody goes to Providence House. They're not bad people. They, bad things happen to them. And they need somebody to take care of their kids so they can address it. And they want you to know that they're good parents. So anyway, so of course, we professors could go on and on about these. I, so I need to stop. But um, again, I'm so grateful that Margaret agreed to do this. She's so perfect for this lectureship because because, well, she said, she's a group worker, right? So if Anna Fritz is up there somewhere, Anna, I found somebody, she's Bonif she's, she's, she's it, she's got cred. And she's read about Grace Coyle, and so your intention when you gave the money for this lectureship is being honored. And it's very important to me, so I'm grateful that you're doing this, thank you. Um, so I'm supposed to read a little bit about Margaret, Oh, also Margaret graduated from Oberlin College, which I did too. And my daughter just graduated, you know, so we have all this. So Oberlin love, you know, just love that too. And some days I want, I, I need to look this up, like how many people went to Oberlin and then Sass? It's a huge number. It's probably a whole club of itself. And I would, I'd love to meet those people. So anyway, Margaret went to Oberlin, but before that she went to Columbia. So again, the Grace Coyle connection. So in Sharon's remarks, she said, uh, Grace Coyle got a certificate from the social work. Really, there was like a school in New York that taught social work um, that sort of morphed into becoming the Columbia School of Social Work. And that's where Grace Coyle went. So Grace Coyle, as a young girl, read about Jane Addams and was inspired and she went to college, and um, when she wasn't in college, she volunteered in a settlement house in Boston. And that's how she really got hooked, which is a little bit like Margaret, actually. Margaret went to Oberlin, and then summers she worked in settlement houses. And so when she finished Oberlin and finished working in various settlement houses, she decided to go to social work school, so she went to Columbia, which was also a pretty good group work school. I mean, not, not quite Western Reserve, but pretty good. So she learned a lot about group work there. And then I think she came back to Cleveland because her husband was at Oberlin. So lucky for us, she finished off at Oberlin. Um, and then she'll tell you about, she's had a very rich career, which again, is all about how you use group work to make change. And so it's so dead on with what this lectureship is supposed to be about. And I'm so grateful that she agreed to do this because I, like, like I said, I just I feel a certain obligation to make sure that we remember this work. Not just because it's part of our history, but, but because it actually works. It, it actually, we're, we're change agents. It's one of our tools in our tool belt. We should keep using it. So Margaret Brodkin is gonna talk to you about her career as a group worker from SAS, how she used those skills to do lots of amazing things, and I won't, I need to stop so I won't get into all that. I'll just say, she's done a lot of amazing things. She'll tell you about it. Um, she's telling you about it so that you can see this is why these tools are so important. And so I should, I should be quiet. So Margaret, please come up and... So. I, I was so honored when you called me and asked me to do this lecture, and it was so much fun to actually prepare for it and, you know, think about what group work had has meant to me, um, which is a huge amount. I've, I've had a very lucky and wonderful, um, privileged career to be working to make social change um, uh, and have been... It, 
particularly for children, youth, and families, uh, and have had the privilege of being able to be successful in that endeavor. I was went through my career and said, I've had 11 different job titles, I think. Um, none of them are social worker, none of them are group worker, and yet when I think of my 50 years, I think it's 50 years, um, I'm always a social worker. That is what I am first. That's uh, and, and as I started to think about group worker, I felt like the core of my values and skills came from group work, came from my interest in dedication to group work. I have had a lot of um, potential you know, graduate students come to me and say, you know, should I get a degree in counseling? Should I get a degree in public policy? You know, what, where should I go from here? And not every time, but almost invariably, I go like, you should really think about social work. It is the profession where we look at both the social issues and the personal <laughs> problems and issues, and it is the profession, the only profession that I know that brings those two things together, and that's why I love being a social worker. Um, sometimes we say, is this one job or two jobs, but it's really sort of one profession, one career. The personal work, the social issues work, each is a reflection of the other, and you have to understand both to be good at, at either of them. And group work for me, I, I mean, I don't think there are many of us that are just living group work graduates at this point. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I've ever met another one. Um, but group work, to me, to me, is the bridge between that, the individual work and the social change work. You can't be an organizer for social change without being a group worker. You can't be a gr good group worker without understanding individuals and how individuals relate in a group. Um, you can't do this work without helping a group, even if you're working on individual issues, helping people grow and develop and become good citizens. So I think that group work is the perfect bridge between the two sides of our profession. So I was inspired. I read this book about Jane Addams. Uh, my mother gave me a biography of Jane Addams in the sixth grade. And I loved the idea. I loved the idea that this woman and her colleagues, you know, lived in the community, developed this incredible institution, Hull House, the, where the reformers and the, the helpers lived in the community, with the, and that people came to this institution to work together, to share their interests, to show their strengths. Um, and uh, it was an institution that was not, you weren't a client, you were a participant, it was non-stigmatizing, it was was and still is my idea of a perfect community institution that helps people and communities be healthy and thrive. And I loved that from their work in the community, and it was in the community where that reflected the issues they were concerned about, equality, poverty, um, that out of that grew their, their social consciousness and their ideas about you know, progressive reform. Um, they worked on juvenile justice issues, on immigrant rights, on uh, compulsory education, on child labor, and it all grew out of the experience in the community that people were having in the center that they created. Uh, Hull House. So as a group work student, so it was just a natural for me to go to social work school, and you got to choose between community organizing, group work, and casework. It was just a natural to say, I'm, I'm a group worker. Um, and I loved the education that I got. It's the most meaningful education that I ever had, and I had a good education at Oberlin, but it wasn't anywhere near as meaningful as this was. I loved the commitment to social justice, the ideas about collective learning, the group as a mechanism where people come together to solve problems um, in a non-hierarchical uh, way. They work on common problems. And I loved sort of learning to, the, what, what are the dynamics of a group? Um, how can you help people trust each other? How can you help people um, you know, develop solutions to problems? I even like the fact that groups 
group work was a sort of messy undertaking. You know, you can't plan it well. There's all these people in the group, and you never know what's going to happen. And honestly, I remember I had to get it out in preparation for this. I got out this old box from my attic where I had all my process recording from. I don't know if other people are in the room. You know, we did process recording. We wrote down every damn word that happened in the group, and your supervisor or your per, your your teacher would go through everything and say, you missed it here, or this was really fabulous, you really got it, you, you, or you did understand what the group was doing, or you didn't understand, or this, they were in this um, stage of group development. Um, that got hardwired into me. I, I, I don't, you know, I, I couldn't teach group work now. But the, all the concepts, the skills, just got hardwired into me. So I carry them everywhere. And every place, every job I've ever had, every, you know, I, I am a group, group worker, and it's made me a really good um, social worker. And one of the things that I learned, by the way, was listening. You know, how important listening was to helping a group do what the group needed to do. So when I, I'd never heard of Grace Coyle, it's true. I felt that I, after I started learning about her, and I, they found me this paper called um, Group Work and Social Change that she had written. She wrote it in 1935, which was the same time that she was developing a whole curriculum of group work. Um, I felt like I had found a kindred spirit. And I loved the paper. Um, you know, she talks about groups as a place where we learn about democracy, a place where we, you know, learn about citizenship, about agencies as being a microcosm of collective life in action. And she is was very excited about the role of group work in promoting social change. Her paper, uh, I'll read a piece of it at the end of this, is, is aspirational. I mean, as she is saying, we need to do this. Uh, she uh, is partly saying, we haven't gotten there yet, but this is where we need to go as group workers. So my career, and I started thinking back, and I think, yeah, I, I've always been a group worker, and I think I said that to you on the phone. Um, and uh, so when I left Cleveland, uh, I went to San Francisco, and my first job was at the Jewish Community Center running the children's program. Of course, it was the closest thing I could find to a settlement house, to a community center. And um, it was very exciting for me to be supervising people who I thought of as group workers. But I started listening to the parents because listening was one of the you know, big skills of social work and of group work. And they were bringing their kids, you know, to the drama group, to the gymnastics group, to the swimming group, you know, it, a different group every day. And I'm like, this, w w what is it you're trying to do? Well, what they really wanted was an after school program where they could bring their kids every day. And honest to God, I know it's hard to believe now, there were no after school programs. It was not a thing. And we started the first after school program in San Francisco. Which which is the continuous, uh, I had to get in my car and pick up all those kids because there was no mechanism to, um, you know, to make sure everybody got there because we're talking about uh, parents who work and it was very controversial at the time and the center did not want, that's not the way we do things. Um, but it was the first after school program in San Francisco. It's a, been continuous. It's now the largest after school program in San Francisco. And and as we all know, after school programs are one of the major venues where we still practice, social, practice group work. I then went from there, I, my husband and I decided we'd get out of the, out of the city. It was kind of a mistake we came back, but, um, and we went to this rural county, and he was the town doctor, and I was the county mental health program. Um, I was the single mental, and there were plenty of crazy people there, but, um, uh, 
what I, it, it, there was no job description, and what I found myself doing was starting groups, you know, starting a, a teen group and a parent group and a diet group and a women's group. It was sort of natural, a part of me, and it was a very effective way to actually move into the community and um, help people with the issues that they were facing. I mo we moved back uh, uh, from the. Uh, gold country from rural California, and I ran a residential treatment program for mentally ill young adults. It was a therapeutic community. It was a group. All we did was groups. You know, somebody didn't do the dishes, we're having a group and we're going to talk about it. Um, if somebody started going off the rails, because half the people there were psychotic, but you know, we'd call a group and the group would solve the problem. So this group work thing um, just, you know, was the, my natural way of how to get work done and how to help people help each other. So I went from that job to a job that I then had where I have done my major work to um, uh, a small advocacy, it wasn't called an advocacy organization in San Francisco at the time, called, I changed the name of it, called Coleman Advocates for Children and Youth. And Coleman was the name of the woman who gave the money to start the organization. Um, and I, there were only two employees. I was the executive director and I had a secretary. Um, but it was, it, it became an opportunity to build and grow and discover how you make social change and how in what an, an incredible part of making social change a group is before i tell you about the two groups i do um want to tell you what we were able to accomplish in the 26 years i was at this organization because um it was pretty amazing um, because we leveraged all the power of the community and groups in the community and parents and youth. But San Francisco is now a major leader in serving children, youth, and families. Um, we spend more local dollars per population on children, youth, and family services um, than any place in the country. We were the first place to have a dedicated funding stream for children, youth, and families um, in the country. I've been all over the country talking about talking about that. Um, and uh, it's uh, still in place and really had really changed the way the city um, uh, treats children, youth, and families. We have universal preschool. We have more subsidized childcare slots than, than any place in, in uh, California by far. We have augmented the wages of our childcare workers. We have developed uh, uh, alternatives to incarceration so that we have a very tiny population uh, in detention. We have clinics in every sec secondary school. We have virtually accomplished now after school for all. We have universal health care for kids very early on. We have model parks, nutrition programs. We have youth development programs in every neighborhood, a family resource center in every neighborhood. And uh, we have a department of children, youth, and their families, which does the planning and coordination. All this happened during those 26 years. But the most important thing we did is really change the culture of the city when it came to children, youth, and families so that the advocates for children, the parents, youth, are a very influential force in the city. They're reflected in the budget priorities. Um, we have ballot measures, lots of them on the ballot for children. They pass overwhelmingly. Um, I just heard about another one yesterday. I go like, oh my God, we have more money per kid than any place else in the country, and now we're going for universal child care. So what we did is leverage the power of this very small organization. Um, I, you know, it was two people when I came, eight people when I left, and the voices of youth and parents and all the coalitions and the community uh, infrastructure that we developed. And, um, you know, it, it really revealed the, uh, uh, it's a sort of previously unappreciated well of support in the community for children and the community's willingness to invest in children. So why was group work at the center of this? So 
you know, I had this philosophic belief that, you know, the best ideas about how to solve problems come from the people who are experiencing the problems. That's a sort of basic tenant of social work and a basic tenant of organizing. Um, and uh, I can say, after my experience doing this work, that all the good ideas, all the good ideas that this organization, that this group of people promoted came from the people who were impacted. And we won because of their voices, because they were the most effective in making the case. So it became our job to enable, to allow that to happen. So, uh, we, you know, it took 10 years to, of the organization, I, I wasn't there the whole time at the beginning, but um, to develop a structure through which to sort of do this effect, as effectively as possible. And the most important part of the structure was that we developed two sort of parallel organizations. We were all part, a parent organization and a youth organization. Um, as we moved this agency from being a think tank to an advocacy group to being a leadership development group to being an organizing group. Um, so I will tell you about the two groups. Um, one was called Youth Making a Change we referred to it as WIMAC. The young people that we initially convened named the group. So, uh, and it, I'm very proud that both of these groups that I'm going to tell you about are 30 years later still there and have moved from, you know, like, let's have a youth group. Okay, they can come to the agency, you know, one couple hours, one day a week to now, but both these groups really run the agency. They are the agency. And um, this has become a very powerful organization in San Francisco. It's really one of the most influential in terms of public policy. So, uh, but, you know, it started with, you know, people going like, hey, you know, if we really believe all this stuff, where are the young people when we're, you know, trying to figure out what we need to be doing? And so we recruited a group of young people, and we were absolutely committed to the idea that this was their group, their agenda. Our job was to facilitate their vision and their ideas about um, what what happened and uh, about what needed to happen in the city. The thing that we we did, the sort of ground rules of the group, was the job of this group is to make this a better city for young people, and we purposely recruited people who young people who were absolutely not student council people who were the people who were experiencing the problems that we were that we really wanted to address um, and so the group became it was a sort of combination of personal healing and community change, each being totally interconnected. One couldn't happen without the other. So it started like, okay, we'll meet a couple hours. Well, then it became, they lived there, you know, it was three, four days a week. There were evenings, weekends, uh, you know, retreats. Um, you know, first it was like, oh, a person who's gonna work, you know, part-time doing this. By the end of this effort, you know, a couple of years in, we had three staff people devoted to youth making a change. That was the level of support and energy that it took. Um, and it's amazing. They studied the issues, they made decisions, they shared tasks, they held each other accountable. You know, they did flaky, stupid things, but they were became stars in the city and they really changed the culture of the city. So I'm gonna give you a couple examples of that. Um, when the community, when San Francisco was concerned about violence, um, and it, uh, the police proposed, and a lot of school board members went along with it, that we put metal detectors in the schools. Um, and our youth group said, hell no. We don't need, they, they didn't say hell, I don't think, but maybe they did, I don't know. Um, the they said, we don't need metal detectors, we need clinics, we need mental health services. And that began a campaign driven totally by young people to get clinics 
in the schools. They surveyed their, their peers, they wrote position papers, they met with elected officials, and I will never forget that, it, you know, I don't know if you've been part of a Get Clinics in Schools campaign, but the schools and the health departments, they, at least in San Francisco, they, they couldn't talk to each other. And honestly, it was young people starting to come to the meetings, and it became too embarrassing for them to say, we can't work together. We have two different ideas about, about how to get this work done. So um, the young people testified in front of the city council, uh, and the health department and the school district developed a sort of concept that they could agree on, and it was the young people in the room that made that happen. Um, it, 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 we called them wellness centers uh, because they weren't quite clinics. That was part of the, the whole deal, um, but it set the stage. We now have a clinic wellness center in every secondary school in the city. It was just amazing, and it was started by young people, and part of the, the scheme was um, the, the city put a down payment, the health department put a down payment, the, to, the school district did to, um, to uh, you start the first, I think, four, four uh, wellness centers. And they're not, the, the young people were adamant it's got to be overseen by a youth council that determines what happens. Eat the wellness centers now are every wellness center has to have a youth council that oversees it and uh, you know, has a major role in, in what the programming looked like. So that was a major accomplishment of a group of young people um, who were able to rally some of the, rally their peers. Second issue they worked on, not the second, the second issue I'm going to tell you about is um, the juvenile hall. A, a lot of these young people had had experiences in the juvenile justice system and had been in our juvenile hall. And they were adamant that there were a lot of young people there who didn't need to be there. Now, adults had worked on this issue before and subsequently, but it was amazing. I remember, you know, one of these kids explaining to me what a risk assessment instrument is, you know, and why they were developing their own risk assessment instrument, which was, you know, what you use to determine who gets, play, you know, who gets uh, institutionalized and, and, and who doesn't. Um, and they, I mean, they learned all this stuff. And these are, you know, starting with kids who are doing very poorly in school, you know, learnt, talking about risk assessment instruments. Um, and as a result of this campaign that they carried on, the criteria, the criteria was changed. The culmination of it came when they did something that none of the adult advocates uh, really felt comfortable doing. They started having demonstrations in front of the juvenile hall and calling the press. And wow, that was great. And that, that became a milestone in our ongoing, never-ending efforts to improve our juvenile justice system. They also became interested in having an institutionalized voice in city government. And a member of our board of supervisors, that's like our city council, said, was interested in youth commissions. And um, they, they thought, oh, that's cool. We need a youth commission, a real youth commission. It was on the ballot. It didn't win. And then the young people took over the campaign and said, and got it on the ballot again, where the people who went to the newspapers, et cetera, got the endorsements. And the second time around, because it was a young people's campaign, the youth commission won. And that they were not happy with that. That was like, OK. We, we know what's going to happen. All these politicians are just going to, you know, put their kids' friends on it. So they went through this whole process of what the criteria should be. They started recruiting people to apply for it. They came up with a slate of people who, who they thought should be on the commission. They carried on about it. And it was amazing. Most of their slate ended up on the commission. A couple of them ended up on the commission. And I think the commission was studied by somebody from the Michigan School of uh, Social Work as the most effective, most powerful youth commission that he had seen. Because um, 
at the youth insisted that written into the second piece of legislation is the requirement that anything that impacted only young people in the city had to be run by the youth committee, had to be get get the um, uh, uh, advice from the youth com youth commission. So the second thing, that, then the last thing I'll tell you about that they started doing was um, a lot of this work took um, surveying their colleagues. And so we got the idea about having an annual youth vote, and you'll see this in the video, um, in the schools. And for years, this group, and it, you know, it turned over, uh, young people would stay three years maybe, um, uh, um, a couple would go on, go on to become staff, uh, but they, instituted an annual youth vote in the schools done through the social studies classes at the time of elections where young people would vote on things on the real ballot but would also vote on what their priorities were and whether they would use a clinic in the schools and whether you know what the whether, whether having youth employment programs was more or less important than having something else um, and uh, that got institutionalized. It is still happening today, you know, like 20 years later. It has now been taken over by the Youth Commission and is the mechanism through which two members of the, the two student members of the school board are elected. So you can see how this thing has a ripple effect. Of course, these staff people had to be fabulous and they didn't call themselves group workers, but they were group workers, you know? They were therapists and caseworkers and teachers and facilitators and, you know, uh, uh, chauffeurs and rec workers. They were, in my judgment, they were group workers, and I had the privilege of sort of supervising them and helping them. Um, they were with the young people day and night, um, and they were, you know, taught how to collect data, how to pu speak publicly, um, and they became a very powerful entity, not just an arm of our organization, a major arm, but uh, in the city. And another ripple effect of it was that other youth development agencies saw these young people and the power that they had and the voice that they had and started developing their own youth leadership groups. And then the youth leadership groups formed a coalition and on and on. So it really led me to my belief that of the link between sort of personal transformation and community transformation. So I'll, now I'll tell you about the parent group. Um, and I like talking about this because I staffed it for eight years. Or, <laughs> and so it's when I got to really be a group worker. Um, and I'm sitting around talking to some of the parents of the kids in the youth group. And, um, you know, one of us says, they say I said it, I say they said it, um, said we should have a parent group. We should do the same thing these young people are doing. Um, and we started this group. The purpose was to make the city a better place for children, youth, and families. They called themselves Pay Parent Advocates for Youth, and it was the same. It was the same dynamic. You know, group decision making, staff. They had a total autonomy to develop their issues. Um, the selection criteria. The two women who started this idea um, selected the first group. They were adamant. There's got to be a parent in it from every neighborhood in the city. That is just one fabulous idea, I have to tell you. It got people together who normally don't talk to each other, which was very exciting for them. It also is very powerful because when somebody objects, well, that in my com you know, that can't happen in my community. Well, we just happen to have someone uh, from your community in the group, so it, it, it ended up having a whole lot more power than the 12 members would indicate. And they met once a week three hours we provided, you know, dinner and childcare and all that. And then they said, you know, okay, everybody's going to have to do some homework. The other is for three hours a week being an advocate in the, in the community. They got a stipend. Uh, it was very small to sort of pay for the cost of being in the group. And it was fabulous, you know. It's a wonderful culture of support and candor and... Um, excitement, and you will see some of that in the video I'm going to show. Uh, they, oh, I had a wonderful board of directors. 
And I said, we're going to give these groups total autonomy over what issues they want to work on, because that's what a good group worker does, right? Um, and uh, you know, o over time, I passed the staff role on to one of the members of the group who became a member of the staff. Um, at the meetings, you know, they would gossip and they would report back and they would plan and strategize. And we had trainings. We just, they were especially interested in training in public speaking. Um, I spoke with some of the members just recently in preparation for this. Oh, the thing I remember was you know how we got taped speaking and how we learned how to do public speaking. Because of our agency, they, when they invited the budget director for the city to come talk to them about the budget and teach them about the budget, so it became a place to do networking in the group with city officials. Um, and you know, when there was a Stand for Children event, they participated, so I felt like they were part of a national movement. And then you know, people started asking them, "Well, come train, come train us on how to do parent organizing or or, or run a parent group." So they they they. Did did that. So I'm going to tell you about two issues they worked on just quickly here, um, uh, which was the heart of the experience, uh, which was to pick issues they wanted to work on. Um, and so they're sitting around complaining about, you know, how they didn't have any place to take their kids uh, kids over the um, over the weekend and how terrible they had to cr go across the city because that was the only place there was a decent park. And everybody goes, everybody's like, yeah, yeah, we need to start doing something about the parks. Um, so this became a very long campaign. They developed their ideas about what what, what is a good park? They started making site visits to parks, so all the parks in the city, playgrounds um, in the city. They started writing their findings. And, you know, it was horrible. People were really, you know, the equipment bore, you know, just equipment broken and board staff and graffiti. And, you know, I remember one woman coming back and said, you know, there was excrement in the corner at the rec center. Um, people were really outraged. And so they did this report card um, and you know you could look and the report card was a map you know and you could see in an instant oh gee the rich parts of town they were they're they're getting an a oh the poor car parts of town they're getting a d's and f's it was very powerful they decided to start with a press conference it was the best attended press conference parents and a crappy park talking and showing this report card showing what was going on in the city you know hearings press interest uh rec and park department starts going insane gets on the defensive uh it started an amazing uh campaign to really clean up the parks and really invest serious money in the parks you know at least initially, there was millions uh, more dollars put into the, into the parks, and um, I, you know, I I, I talked to uh, one of the women from the group recently. She said the thing I remember most was going back to that park a year later and seeing that it had been cleaned up, and so um, it was kind of amazing. Uh, what it also did is put this group on the map. So now everybody knew who they were, and as they moved on to other issues. Um, one of the things they did work on, <clears throat> oh, one of the members of the group worked in a health food store, and she was a nut about healthy food, and she would come in, and you know, the food they serve these kids at lunch, it's awful. And everybody starts agreeing, yeah, I don't want my kids eating that. Um, and um, then there was an article in the paper about moldy food, and they go, they, yeah, let's, let, let's do something about that. And so they surveyed, you know, parents, what do you think of the school food? They went and visited, et cetera. You know, no traction with the, the you know, school board. The superintendent was not interested. So they go like, okay, what are we gonna do? So, well, let's take him a school lunch. Uh, okay, <laughs> who's got the nerve to do that? And a couple of the, at this point it was women, in the group said, okay, well, we'll, we'll do it. Um, and this is not good advocacy planning because when they got to the um, superintendent's office, he wasn't there, so like, Somebody had to go in 
and put this lunch on his desk. Who was going to? And, and then they got together and they wrote a little note to go with the lunch, which said, "Can you eat this?" And um, it really made a big impression on the superintendent. It was fabulous. And uh, uh, the next, it became an issue at the next school board meeting. And the ovens that had been a problem were fixed, and two new supervisors were hired to oversee the food program. And it's still something we're working on. This stuff is never over. But it was very fun. And uh, um, when you have a, so it became an arm of the organization, it became its own organization. We're sitting around talking and, you know, one person says, you know, there ought to be a law, and I can't remember what the law was supposed to be, and somebody else says, there, there ought to be a lot of new laws. And somebody else says, you know, let's, let's get everybody together and talk about all the new laws we need. And it led to an agency-wide there ought to be a law conference. And everybody, you know, they recruit people to come to the conference. Everybody has ideas, which led to a speak up for kids day in City Hall so that people could go and talk about the laws they wanted to see passed. And you see how this kind of thing is a ripple effect and the speak up for kids day got institutional in the in the city and I think went on for maybe 15 years um, I never knew what issues they were gonna like capture their imagination I had somebody call me and say you know I really because now they're famous right I really want to come talk to your parent group about how awful it is that they want to move the de Young Museum downtown I go like you know that's not an issue that I think they're going to want to work on. It's not a child advocacy issue. It's, and I, I told her no, she couldn't come. And then I confessed to the group that I had turned this person down. Oh, well, really? We want to hear from her. <laughs> she comes to the group, and everybody goes like, hell yeah. Um, we want, it, it, we take our kids to Golden Gate Park. That's the best part of Golden Gate Park. We, you know, we don't want to see the, the, the museum move downtown. And I go, okay. <laughs> um, and they were adamant about it. They convinced the rest of the agency that this was an important issue. The youth people were not into it. It was like, really? That's what we're going to work on? No. But other people in the agency and the parents were into it. And, you know, the organization and the parents uh, linked up with a member of the DeYoung family and carried on this campaign to keep the museum in the park. And um, we never would have worked on it if our parents hadn't been interested in it. Um, and the museum stayed. It's a long, complicated story. And then the Academy of Science then could stay, too. And if you ever go to San Francisco and visit Golden Gate Park, you will see one of the biggest tourist attractions is, uh, is the museum and the, uh, that, that part of the park. And, you can thank our parent group for, <laughs> for, for that happening because an awful lot of powerful people in the city were going to move, that, move it all downtown. So, of course, they went to school board meetings, um, you, you know, and that was a central part of what they did and got involved in the budget issues and then got outraged at all the people on the school board who would be you know, reading their mail while they were talking and decided to you know, get involved, develop a slate of, for the school board campaigns. <laughs> And um, you know had had it really out for one of the school board members. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> as a result of the slate and the campaign, um, she lost her campaign, uh, and but their their candidate did not win. But anyway, that, so that's the kind of things they also did their individual actions in their neighborhoods because that was what they had agreed they would do. They would testify, they would go table, they would circulate petitions, they'd work on getting their local library, getting a beacon center, getting you know getting the opposing the increase in cost of the merry-go-round in Golden Gate Park, uh, you know, working on the juvenile hall issues, um, working on, oh my God, there was one member of our group who became enraged because the Edison Corporation wanted to move into the public school. Do you remember them? They were the for-profit Chris Whittle. Does anybody remember that he ran a for-profit, yeah, <laughs> uh, char charter for-profit, oh my God, yeah. 
that was a crusade. Um, and, but, and I want to tell you, before I show the video, I, I, had to, I never had got to do a longitudinal study or what happened to, the, to people, but I, I, in that first group and then the subsequent group, um, one of them became the deputy director of the organization, uh, the most amazing person in the world. One went to DC to work in the, in the welfare rights, become a leader in the welfare rights. Another became uh, the president of her neighborhood association and is still like on the board and it's a powerful association and everybody comes and kisses their ring to, in order to get elected to office. Another one got involved with her church in the um, PICO organizing uh, efforts of her church and became a leader in that. Another became the head of um, the Parent Voices Organization, the Child Care Organizing Group. It, it had a profound effect on people's lives and their ability to get involved in their community. It was a total experience. Their kids came. <laughs> Some of the kids got became activated, seeing that was seeing their parents, um, and I had a parent tell me recently that uh, the father is uh, the kids used to complain like, "Where's mom? <laughs> oh, mom's helping some other kid," um, and he was able to say, "He said, well, just turn on the TV. You'll see where mom is." And mom was testifying before our board of supervisors. That was a big memory in the family history. So I, I called on one of my um, one of the members of the group. We had it was mostly women, but. This is a man. Um, I, I said, you know, I'm going to give this talk. Tell me what I should say. And so he wrote me this email. He said, what I remember best about PAY, that was the name of the group, Parent Advocates for Youth, is the bonding and relationship building of PAY members as well as skills building. The real point of group work, I imagine. I'm telling I'm talking about group work. And yes, the essence of organizing is as much personal transformation as social change, winning victories, building power. Ultimately, we have to be better to do better, the change we seek. I didn't think I'd like Mary Harris at first, and I certainly disagreed with her on many issues, but I grew to love her fighting spirit, her tenacity, her commitment to helping her community be better. It taught me a lot about what leadership looks like. Being a part of pay helped me learn that. Equals helping equals be more than they thought they could be alone for and with each other. I'm sure that forging that the forging of lasting bonds and the cauldron of struggle is very much one of the aims of organizing, but it's also at the heart of good social, good social, social work. I learned that from you. He's writing to me. I remember Teresa Gallegos telling a parent who decided to send her kid to Edison, the for-profit school, which we adamantly opposed, that she respected her. Our fight isn't with you powerful stuff. Two other phrases I've found helpful in describing group work, believing that people can, showing people how, helping people do, connecting individuals to community and building a community around each individual. This last is particularly relevant for me because I know it describes my journey back from homelessness. And my experiences in pay were very much rooted in relying on, learning from, learning to love and trust a community of people around me, equals helping each equals transforming one another while building a better community. He's a very articulate <laughs> uh, person. So I'm going to show the video now, um, which tells you about these groups. And I, I look, you don't very, one of the reasons that I'm talking about these groups is I have this video, right? It's a fabulous video. But um, <clears throat> I'm much younger in the video, so just be ready for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so y you'll get a picture of what I've been talking about. So now, who knows how to show the video? You do. <laughs> You don't very often have a video of some work that you do. We had an amazing video person on our board who just felt compelled to do this. You think it's going to work? Thank you. 
what they would like to see in their dream park. Come on, help us out here. There you go. Our goal is to want to raise happy, healthy kids, and sometimes you have to rattle some cages and make some people mad to do the right thing. I think I might have been an advocate, but I didn't know that I was. Um, I think advocates just have something in them. We're trying to be one million strong because we found out, though, hey, we really do run things here, you know? Anybody can do this. Um, you know, we can all do it. We all have something in ourselves that we can express that is important, and it's important to contribute to the democratic process. And what Pay and WIMAC are about is helping people find that. About five years ago, we said to ourselves, we've got to involve many more people <laughs> in this effort to influence uh, the city. And the first group of people that we thought were, of course, young people themselves. And we started WIMAC, Youth Making a Change. People say, you know, you sweep them under the carpet, like forget they even yeah. exist. But we're going to be here. We're here. We exist. And there's, you can't put us aside anymore. Because like the mayor said today, basically, whoever, whoever screams the loudest is going to get their money. So that's how it's going to work. What we do is we're a youth advocate group where we go around trying to make San Francisco a better place for the youth. And whether it means going to see the supervisors, talking to the mayor, or the school board, or principals, and telling them that this is what the youth want and we can, we can make a difference. Like what did you guys come up with in terms of trying to get money back in the budget? What kind of stuff did you talk about yesterday? Talked to him about his campaign. My daughter was one of the first Wymackers. And her time in Wymack made her realize that she had a hand in her future, that she could change how her future would go. And I watched it, and I came upstairs to tell Margaret, you know, thank you, thank you. Whatever I can do, I'm at your disposal. Because, you know, you've literally saved my family because Jua was like a nightmare. So she said, well, you want to start a parent group? Parent Advocates for Youth is a group of great parents, um, parents that care about the kids, and parents who are motivated to get out there and make some changes for, for kids in San Francisco. <laughs> We're all parents. We all struggled with getting childcare. Um, I was on a waiting list for over a year. I was the working poor. I was the secretary for Southern Pacific. I was the last in line. I never did get any type of child subsidy program, which eventually I had to quit my job. I almost had to drop out of school because I couldn't find childcare. I had this vision of babies just taking over City Hall, and I mentioned it to pay and other people at Coleman, and it just captured everyone's imagination. Everyone understood the impact that that could have just instantly. You let Willie Brown know that you came over here, okay? Go ahead and put your name on there, girl. Go ahead and put your name on there. Kids need quality, affordable child care, and how much do we want? Now, our city officials expect babies to invade City Hall at least every year and now they have to be prepared for what they're going to do about it. And as chairperson of the Board of Supervisors Finance Committee, I intend to allocate two million dollars in this high quality child care fund. A supervisor can't get up and look at those kids and say anything except I'll do the best I can. And Half the people who came, the supervisors, didn't intend to speak. And we roped them into speaking, and then they had to say things that we can now hold them accountable for saying. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Eyes, and ears, and mouth, and nose. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes.
season close. I know you want to put everyone back to work, but when I was working, there was no child care for me. And I don't, I don't understand. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for hope. I didn't get child care, so I lost my job. I, that's the same thing with me. Commit to $10 million to child care at the no, first children. And you I don't do it that way. I don't do it that way. I don't do it that way. And you know I don't do it that way. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. You wouldn't be here if I hadn't already demonstrated a willingness to be productive on child care. That's why you're here. And I want you here. I want you to come back often, regularly, and I want you to keep it on the front burner. It's extremely hard for me to stay up and in your face arguing. when no, somebody you, at Muni who no. gets paid to do stay up in your face. It's unfair. On, it's no, un, it's the, the, the women in pay used everything they had learned, all the self-confidence they had gained, and all their knowledge about who really had the power in the city, and just went for it. Their refusal to back down was an inspiration to everyone who was who was watching them, and you know might have thought, oh gee, I would really back down in this situation, and they didn't. Well, he heard us. Does it mean that we're going to get ten million dollars in the budget? No, but it means that he heard us, and that we're we're that we're, we we have to be that beat that's hitting the drum, and he's the drum, so we just have to keep beating at him. Keep beating at him until he's singing the song that we want to hear. What's your name? Hi, Del. Hi, I'm Margaret. Come Hi. on in. We're going <laughs> to... Um, welcome in. Oh, I Del. And so we'll... Let's work with this and then we'll see how we feel. Okay. Okay, so let's start with the budget hearing, please. I love the women in pay. I truly love them. I can't believe how dedicated they are and how articulate they are and what fighters they are and the courage that they have. You know, it's not our job to come up with the program. It's our job to make sure that the people who have that job are doing their job. My life has kind of been on the conservative side. I was raised, don't make waves, just be a good girl and go along. But sometimes if you want to see things get better, you have to ask questions and you have to take action. For example, Rec and Park, we did a report card on the city parks. And we were not always complimentary and I thought oh what if these rec directors are offended or what if well when we saw that the, that certain problems were immediately remedied that um, playgrounds the wood was refinished in a playground because it was dangerous or if something was closed then you think well it may not be comfortable but it's the right thing to do. I just wanted to report that I've spent a couple hours this <laughs> This week, talking to talk line parents and trying to urge them to come out to Saturday's Board of Soups meeting. And some of them, it's their very first time, so they need a lot of encouragement and prepping. And but it's kind of exciting to take what you know we've been learning here. And then God, there's yeah. been so many trainings, so many people yeah. that uh, we thought we would have to pay to come and be speakers that have volunteered their time on how to to speak before a group and not be nervous, how the um, city budget works, how to be an advocacy group, and then the camaraderie between us in pay. So that is, it's, it's great to be a part of a group of other parents that feel just as strong about their own children and other children in the city. I mean, this is the slow erosion of the public schools as we know it, if we allow this to happen. What they missed out was the word P-U-B-L-I-C. This is a public school. The best thing I do is I'm able to speak for children. I've always been an outspoken person anyway, so this is just a ball, and Tay is helping me learn how to speak correctly for parents and really express the things that are in my heart and able to put them into words. I was, I was scared to death standing up there. My legs were buckling. My legs were buckling because I get tired of them you know, saying, oh, not her again. I know that's what they're thinking. I know. I know as he's sitting there picking his nose, he's thinking, <laughs> not her again. So I felt very good that the people before us were so impassioned. Oh, yes. It has changed my life so much. I have to be honest with you, I didn't vote until I started working here. And now, all the women that I used to sit in clutches and we'd talk about, oh, you know, we'll never get, black people will always be down, we'll never get anything. Those women vote too. Because we've actually, we, we see the changes that we make. 
Oh, I, when I got a chance to tell the supervisor how I really felt and wanted to know where was he going to be when all these parents and children and community members were going to answer his question, for the first time, as long as I've been with Coleman, I felt like I was standing on top of the world. <laughs> it was, I hate I told my name, but, <laughs> but it was, it, it, I mean, it really made me understand what was happening, not only to those children, but what can happen to my own children. And I just thank y'all. It was so good. It was so good. <laughs> I love the relationship between the Pay and Coleman and Wymack and Coleman because I feel like we've taken everything that I have learned in 20 years of being an advocate for children, everything that the organization has to offer, all our connections with people in the city, all the expertise we have in the issues, our database, our you know computers, everything, and turned it over to a group of parents and a group of young people and said, use it. He, he's the supervisor who... Who wrote... Or, of, um, yeah, heroin? Talk, well, talk about that and why he's doing like substance abuse work. Youth Vote started because it was so obvious <laughs> that, that, was, that it was the right thing to do. I never thought that WIMAC would be able to do it with the level of sophistication and skill that they do. That's basically like the information about the supervisors. Why do you want to be in the Board of Education? Whoever's the one that interviews them, they're the one that does their statements, or they're the one that does their, their backgrounds. Um, basically, we give, it, we give them a statement, and then we put on, we, we print it out in the books. Take one of these. One of the things I want to do is to talk about a couple of the really important issues that are in the, in the youth vote packet. I hope that your experience in Youth Vote can give you some sense of the importance of voting, but also the importance of, of continuing to talk about these issues, because they have direct impact on you. You shouldn't be in a public school if you don't know English. Your, your family to teach you English. Then how about if they don't know English? That's why. Well, what could you do about it, right? I say no because it helps, like, bilingual classes, it helps a lot of people uh, get to learn that culture. Like, if you like in the Spanish class, it helps a person learn that background or their own background or learn about other people's cultures besides English. I plead the fifth. <laughs> One of the things we hope is that they understand how power works in the society and what it takes to, to get your voice heard. And when you have something that you want to change or you'd like to see happening in your community, what are the things you have to do to make that happen? Who are the people that you have to build relationships with? How do you have to develop a message and communicate it in a way that people can, can hear? What are the strategies that you need to use to be successful and get the things that you want for yourself and for your peers? And the goal is to, to, to help them develop as young activists and advocates and, and grow up along the way because um, they're, they're still growing up and figuring out who they are and what their place in the world is. What's going on? Yes, you are from Coleman. Come on in. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Hello. How are you? Have a seat. We're going to talk about like um what what youth space is about and yeah. why is it important to us and and here's our our budget proposal. Great. Yeah. Well, basically, youth space is um it's a youth driven youth run project that we're, that we're in, in the making. Um, we're, we're holding meetings so far, and we have a meeting today at 3.30 at um, Columbia Park Boys and Girls Club. How do you see making this neutral territory? How do you think it'll, it'll work? What we tell the youth is like, at, in our meetings, is that this is going to be a place where we can actually get to know each other and where we can break down our stereotypes about each other. You, we can't go to the mayor and just say, hey, you know, you got to do this. You got to help us and then talk to them like streetwise. Most people, like the mayor or the supervisors, they won't listen to you. But Coleman, they teach us how to talk to people the right way. Like, this is how you talk to your friends, and this is how you talk to people, political people with power. There's a difference. The purpose of this meeting, basically, is to let you know what's going on and to ask you guys to help us make this happen. 
we complete this youth space, space it'll be a major statement because it's like youth wrote the proposal, youth went and met with the mayor, youth went and met with all the supervisors. The reason it's there is because of youth and it's being ran by youth. Okay, I'm representing Slug and I know we, I, there's like four of these that I, I know definitely we'd love to play key roles in establishing and making sure that this is something that's really good. Um, Hundred thousand dollars is cool, but I mean that's not really enough. Yeah. I think if we yeah. wanted to really, I mean that may be enough to pay for rent, as exactly. you guys have all what said. Wait, 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 wait. I mean we asked the city for more money, but if that's what they want to give us, you know we keep coming at them, telling us, look, this is it, this is what youth space is, and if you're just gonna give us this, it's not gonna happen. So they they understand the realities, and the mayor is also looking at it in his budget. Where I was growing up. A female is expected to get pregnant by the age of 18, you know, and with that life, it's like, I don't want to do that, and I want to do something that's good. And with WIMAC, they're like, there are good things in the city that you can do. You don't just have to go out and, and join a gang or something just to do something in the city. You can always do something good. You can meet people and tell them, this is what's going on in the city. You, you got to step out of your office and actually look. When I was seeing a psychiatrist, she's the one who told me that you can make a difference. I mean, if you want to live, you got to do it the right way. We have really brought young people to the table in a way that has never happened before. I think we've created a whole new culture and climate in the city, both in terms of young people and parents. Yeah, right. 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 Yes, because you know what we're calling this? We're calling this the Quality Enhancement Fund. That's the part that goes for toys. You don't have to say that, but just, you know, get, put the issue of quality. I'm here to talk about a grievous omission in the city budget, and that is for the 24-hour parental stress line talk line. I'm a single dad. I'm raising my daughter. She's going to be three years old in two weeks. You know, and I've never hit her. You know, I felt like hitting her a lot. And what happened was I called 441 Kids. The talk line basically saved my life five years ago when I was homeless, pregnant, and had nowhere to go. In an age where a lot of... Um, federal government and state government is looking at um, intervention instead of prevention. Youth space is something that's going to keep youth off of the streets. It's going to keep youth out of trouble. Youth space is really important. It's a citywide center for the youth that's going to get the youth off the streets. It's going to offer them classes, tutoring, all that stuff that the youth are asking the city to provide for them. And we really need $225,000 to lease this space. I'm a single parent with six children. I have 46 nieces and nephews. I can't tell you how important it is for child care in San Francisco. Now, we are certainly in agreement if the mayor wants to support a Cadillac child care program in City Hall, but we would urge him to also drive that Cadillac to Bayview Hunters Point, to Visitation Valley, to the Tenderloin, to Chinatown, where those real needs are. Look at my child. Look at Kania. How can you say that because another families make less money than ours, that Kenia is less worthy or not in need of child care? The working poor and low-income families' children all need quality child care. What fits beautifully into that is that child care and rec and park can go hand in hand uh, by funding some half-day programs through the rec and park department. We were their counselors, we're their guidance, we're their home away from home, and we're working on paper, scissors, and glue. So I just think that child care, um, as well as other issues, but particularly child care, are incredibly crucial to keeping families, working families, working people, professional people with children in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I just can't actually leave here without saying something about this budget process. This, to me, is a ludicrous joke. How can you have one public hearing on the budget, on a $3.9 billion budget with a $101 million surplus. And you're giving people two minutes to comment on a $3.9 billion 
budget, this is totally unfair. And if this is what we call democracy, I, I really don't think it is. And I just want to say today, and I'm finishing, that today is a new day in San Francisco. We the people will be in your face until we can get our fair share of the budget. We're asking for 31% of the surplus, and we will change this budget process. <laughs> This is the revitalization of democracy, and this is one of the most exciting things I've ever done. And to watch people who have felt literally powerless, who had no idea that decisions were being made, much less that they could impact them, come forward and feel like they have really changed the way the city has done something. She's actually made a soldier, you know. I'll leave Coleman's and I'll, you know, work within my community. and I. That's so exciting to me that I know what to do. I love it. You know, it's so empowering every day. <laughs> I feel that everybody has to make a contribution, and I'm not really, I don't consider myself really artistic or anything, but I feel I am able to draw from personal experience to give my voice to give my time. I changed a lot. I mean, some of my friends, they say that I'm really different. So, we want to introduce the mayor. This is the only way I see myself doing things now, like going out, doing outreach, and organizing towards the community and helping the community in a big way like this. Before I really encountered Wyman, like, I really didn't feel I was equal to the mayor or anything like that. I, like, I could tell him something, but now they got to listen to us. They got to hear our voice, basically. I frankly think that many of the decisions we make would not be made without that advocacy. So no matter, no matter how vexing they may become, no matter how much of an annoyance for some people they may be, they're totally and completely necessary. I'm not as afraid as I was before to take on issues or to take on people. Um, and it's helped me a lot just to have that confidence in myself and to have it show in me so that my, my daughters can see it. the point. <laughs> um, yeah, you don't very often have a video of the work that you do. So uh, I hope that what you've seen, you know, is an illustration of what I have been talking about. Um, I do want to make a few more comments before we turn this over to the panel. Um, you can see the lessons that we learned. I don't need to elaborate on them. But what happened is the agency itself became a group. I mean, we had these groups, and then the agency became a group, and it had to be a collective decision-making process, um, which was, uh, and we bought a church and turned it into a little mini community center. I began to have my little Jane Addams dream. Um, and, uh, you know, the people would disagree, like the, the parents were for the curfew, the young people were against the curfew, what are we going to do now, the board is divided, where, you know, it takes a lot of group work skills to, to work that out. Um, we ended up opposing the curfew, but uh, it, was a, it was a process. Um, 
I, in another just uh, group work strategy that is a social change strategy that you can see illustrated here to some extent is the whole process of building a coalition. A coalition is a group, and a, it's a series of coalitions that begin to really um, make major changes in the uh, in the city. After the uh, high quality child care fund, um, we're having a meeting of the Young Child Coalition, which is child care providers in the city. We're all sitting around the table, and um, everybody goes like, okay, I'm not going to be part of this anymore unless we really address the elephant in the room, which is that child care workers are, live in poverty wages. We can't continue our centers as long as we are making poverty wages. And I'm like... This is a terrible issue. You can't just get up in front of the public and talk about why you need more money. You know, this is not oh, all my, you know, brilliant um, public policy, political instincts go like, I, I, I don't see how we can win on this issue. But I was a good group worker, and the group decided, okay, this year, Childcare wages is going to be what we work on. Well, I was so stupid, you know. I mean, to think that that would work—that's what they wanted to do, and they they convinced parents in childcare centers all over the city that this was core to running a good childcare program and to having a sustainable childcare program and having adults who would see their child, you know, throughout the year, much less from year to year. They mobilized, you know. 10,000 postcards, handwritten individual letters from parents to the mayor and the board of supervisors. And it was one of the most powerful outpouring of the community behind um, uh, uh, an issue that they had. I mean, they're calling my office saying, stop these postcards, stop these postcards. So of course, we you know, ramp up the postcards, right? Um, and uh, I, I can't, don't have time to tell you about it, but suffice it to say, I think we were the first city in the country that lo put local dollars into augmenting child care wages all over um, the city. It's a complicated program. And then a year later, we tripled that program. That was after we took out a full-page ad in the paper telling Willie Brown he was the most wonderful mayor in the world. Um, but it was uh, a coalition and going with the coalition. Um, we had an emergency services coalition, which l resulted in the largest youth center in the um, in, in the, uh, the the city, um, and it was certainly an exemplary coalition because it was not just the providers, it was the Junior League and the Gay and Lesbian Democratic Club and the Archdiocese. It's a, it's a coalition I recommend for <laughs> if you're in San Francisco um, that really got money into services for homeless youth. And then something I work on now and talk about a lot, which I don't have time to talk about today, which was sort of the mother of all coalitions. We formed the Children's Budget Coalition when, you know, it became increasingly clear that unless there was just more money, you know, we were not going to be able to do all the things that parents, young people, that the city was now, you know, we were demanding of the city. And that's when we created the first dedicated children's fund in the in the country, and um, the fund is now seventy five million dollars a year. I'm proud to say, and um, started started out as twelve. So. Um, and what I'm doing now, actually, I started this organization called Funding the Next Generation, where I go around to cities and counties and talk about how to mobilize, how to organize, how to develop voices of parents and youth, and you know, on behalf of getting the resources that we need for for our services. Um, after I left Coleman, um, the mayor invited me to run the city's Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families, which was a great privilege, which I did for five years until the mayor and I had a disagreement um, and not no surprise uh, I wasn't made for bureaucracy um, 
I brought groups into, I said, we're going to run a different kind of bureaucracy here. And I had a youth group that reviewed all the grants and a parent group that developed the parent programming and had the after school group and all the service provider subgroups developing the standards for their programs that they would then have to comply with. So it was like, bringing group work into a city bureaucracy. And um, it was very exciting. It's a little too exciting for the city at some point. But um, it was, it set up precedent and um, uh, a, a new way of doing business. I then had the privilege and opportunity to start and sort of invent the city's community school initiative. So you hear the theme, community school, a community center in a school. I love the community school model. It's like bringing the settlement house uh, in, in, into the school. And now I've told you what I'm doing, which is called funding the next generation. So I have three recommendations based on my experiences about the future of group work. Um, one is I can't imagine not being trained to be a group worker. All right. It, in group work. It's just crazy. Um, the level of detail and skill and the process recording um, and, you know, that everything we do is a group and we don't, we're not trained to make it work. And so I, you know, we think we are. This is not group therapy. It's not the same as group therapy at all. And it's not your little course on group facilitation. I have carried on a, a war about some of the group facilitation stuff that goes on. Do, do you all do the charting? You've been to meetings and everybody charts and... Um, do you know what I'm talking about? The charting, it's very, very popular with group facilitation types. And you know, you're, you're charting away and everybody's looking at the chart and everybody's looking at the charter and they're not looking at each other and talking to each other. So many of the gimmicks that we now use to facilitate groups aren't group work, you know? They're, they're not people really having a deep conversation and they're very frustrating a lot of, a lot of the time. Um, so I really want people to get trained in group work. The second thing I want is I am sick about the state of our core group work agencies. San Francisco had about five settlement houses. Um, you know, the, the settlement house reformers came out to San Francisco. They're in New York. There are some in, in Cleveland, I'm sure. These basically are agencies that are really struggling. Um, a few have gotten beyond the funding problems that exist. Um, and we have, you know, there's the settlement houses and, you know, what I call their cousins and relatives, family resource centers and beacon centers and neighborhood houses, all sort of multi-service community-based entities, which I think should be the heart of what we do to transform communities and, and transform people. Um, when Hull House was in its heyday, there were 65 groups going every day, 2,000 people a week coming there. There, I, so I, I got out a photograph book of Hull House. There were, you know, women making their native clothing. There was a theater and a labor museum and a, ba a marching band and dancing and furniture making and crafts and cooking. And people were, it's just a vibrant place where people could come together and share their ideas and share their strengths. Um, and Hull House doesn't exist anymore. You know, it, uh, I, I don't know the story of the demise of Whole House, but um, if it's like the places in San Francisco, part of it is the money. You know, our funding streams really, in my opinion, conspire to prevent us from having a holistic approach to communities and to people. We have to do things in very um, uh, segmented, categorized way. And I tried when I was head of the Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families and I had control over money to start something I called the Anchor Institution Initiative, where we brought all the anchor institutions together and said, okay, what do you need? Why are, you know, why the struggle? And we picked five that would get uh, quite a bit of money, special grants, and say, what is it going to take for you to be a, um, a more of a community organizing, community building institution, and a, and a more vibrant in 
institution. And um, most people use the money for infrastructure, which they, you have no money for when you have your separate fund, funding streams, and for sort of community builders, community organizers. And, um, and it was very successful in those five places. But And I started to study some of the um, settlement houses in New York. And I mean, everybody was doing the same thing. You have your senior lunch program, you get money for that, but you don't get money to then do what, you know, they're there and there are all kinds of things that they need and support that they need and, you know, things they want to do together. Well, you, you can feed them or you can have an after school program, but heaven forbid, you know, it doesn't increase test scores and uh, is, you know, isn't a more holistic, comprehensive program. You can have a preschool, but, you know, in most cases, that doesn't include all the parent support kind of services, parents coming for dinner. So um, I think our funding streams have really stood in the way of the what I call a group work, you know, in institution. Um, and one other thing, and I don't know what the solution to this is, and it's, it, it bothers me all the time because I'm an activist and an advocate, and people are so constrained because now, you know, 90% of everybody's funding comes from the government. So how are you going to kick ass and, you know, fight for the kind of reforms that are needed when the very people who fund you <laughs> are sitting in front. I was trying to imagine, you know, Jane Adams, you know, having to go before the city council or the state and, you know, fight for funding every year as she was demanding that the, you know, laws of the of, of the country and say uh, change um, it's really a barrier to activism and social change so um, and the last recommendation is I really group work is not just having better staff meetings or it, group work is an instrument of social change and really needs to be used as an instrument of social change I had this incredible experience which you got to see through the video of of group work being a very powerful powerful um, uh, institute, uh, you know, uh, force for social change. I was placed at the Garden Valley Community Center when I was in Cleveland. And um, I had a girls group, and they got it into their heads. They wanted to have a big, uh, put on a big show and have people from you know, all their friends and colleagues from the, from, from the neighborhood would perform, and they wrote a play, um, which we would now say was about bullying, but it was about something, you know, is very I important to them. And it was like Saturday afternoon or something, and the place was full. They, people were hanging from the rafters. You could not get into this. And the next morning, I, uh, Monday morning, I w went and all the community organizing people and the supervisors like, how did you do that? We've never had that many people <laughs> at, at, you know, at all the meetings we've ever had. And, you know, it's like, well, we went with what they wanted to do. <laughs> they defined the issue. They defined the goal. And um, they got their message out. They did their play about bullying. And so it was, it was a sort of interesting lesson to me. So I'm going to read to you um, the last uh, paragraph of Grace Coyle's paper about social change because it is aspirational. It says, this paper is an attempt to point out a few of the ways in which group work may contribute to social change in essential and significant respects. Whether or not it will do so in practice will depend on whether we as group workers adopt educational objectives which recognize social needs as well as individual growth. For the fulfilling of such objectives, the group worker will require not only a set of techniques valuable as these are, not only a skill in program making or organizing, but in addition, a social philosophy and the courage to turn his philosophy into action, only so he can become an adequate group worker, or for that matter, what is perhaps more important, an adequate citizen of a new age. I think we're on the same team, Grace and me. <laughs> um, and it is particularly important in the age of Trump, 
oh my God, as our democracy seems to be, you know, flailing to have these places where you learn democracy and learn the value of it and learn what it is to have a collective enterprise and think of the collect, have a, a spirit of, of, of mutual aid and being in, in this together and solving problems together. We could go on and on about that. So I want to close because, I, you know, I, I do give speeches and they're mostly about, they're not about group work. They're mostly about trying to get people engaged in, you know, civic life. And um, I, I and lots of other people um, often end or begin our speeches with this Margaret Mead quote. You do know this quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, dedicated citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So I read that quote again, and I thought, I love this quote. I know, I know I love this quote, but now I really appreciate it because what she's saying is that the work of social change is best done in a small group. And you know me, the group worker, I've read this a hundred times and I just glossed over that. And it is certainly an endorsement of everything. <laughs> Uh, in this talk and the, the theme of what I'm trying to get across. So 